A very good morning, Mr. Dharman Shadmagaratnam, Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister for Economic and Social Policies, Republic of Singapore, Dr. Raghuram Rajan, Governor, Reserve Bank of India, His Excellency Mr. T.K. Lim, High Commissioner of Singapore to India, Ambassador Gobinath Pillay, Chairman at the Institute of South Asian Studies, National University of Singapore and Ambassador at Large, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Singapore, Mr. Nainat Kirby, Deputy Chairman, CII Western Region, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies, ISAS for short at the National University of Singapore, and our co-organizing partner, Confederation of Indian Industry, CII, we warmly welcome you to this morning's Singapore Symposium 2016. This Singapore Symposium is a signature event organized by the Institute of South Asian Studies and today's session is our fourth edition of the symposium in India and fifth in this region. The highlight of the Singapore Symposium 2016 is the interactive session that all of us have been waiting for with Singapore's Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister for Economic and Social Policies, Mr. Dharman Shanmugaratnam, and the Honorable Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, Dr. Raghuram Rajan. And to commence today's proceedings, it's my great pleasure to invite Ambassador Gobinath Pillay, Chairman of the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore, and Ambassador at Large, Singapore's Foreign Ministry, to deliver the welcome remarks. Ambassador, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming on a working day, especially so early in the morning. Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Coordinating Affairs Policies of Economics and Social Matters, Mr. Tharman Sharmugaratam, Governor of the Central Bank of India, RBI, Dr. Raghuram Rajan, High Commissioner for Singapore, T.K. Lim, Consul General, Mr. Ajit Singh, Mr. Nainan, Mr. Mugundan of CII, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great pleasure to see so many familiar faces here, quite a large number of Singaporeans and a quite a large number of friends of Singapore, like Mr. Deepak Parekh. Uh, I know Shyamal Gupta is here, the first Tata man in Singapore. So we have uh, a very good cross-section of Singapore supporters in this, uh, this thing. Um, the Singapore Symposium, as Sitara says, is something that we devised to present in, in India. Unlike other think tanks, which do a lot of academic work on various policy matters and so on, we do one step further. We go to the countries in, the, in South Asia and interact with them. We actually hold programs, workshops, seminars, book launches, and so on. Uh, we did a book launch on a book on Maoist, Maoism. Uh, and the launch was done by Dr. Ansari. And he asked me, why is that Singapore is doing it? I haven't seen anybody else doing it. So I said, yes, we, our interest is quite widespread, and we look at various matters, not only just economics or uh, political science, but other uh, relevant uh, issues that affect South Asia. As uh, Sitara said, this is our fourth edition. The very first one, the guest of honor was our founding prime minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. He had a dialogue with Mr. Ratan Tata. The second one, we had a dialogue between our Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Sien Lung, and Gautam Tapa of Aspen Ananda. The third one was a dialogue in Chennai uh, between our then Foreign Minister, Mr. Shanmugam, and Shyam Saran. This is the fourth one, and this one we have, as you see, two iconic figures in the finance world having a dialogue. 
there will be a free flow of sort of ideas and, and, uh, and uh, issues discussed, and it will be open to the House as well. And later on, you will have a chance to ask the questions. The dialogue between a member of the financial community in Singapore, the, the highest official, and Singapore's foreign minister, I did not give too much of background on these people because I think it's all very well known. But perhaps because it's the first one that we are having in Mumbai and the first one that our Deputy Prime Minister is having in Mumbai. Maybe I'll say just a couple of words about him. He started off as the Managing Director before he entered politics. He, became, he was the Managing Director of Monetary Authority of Singapore, which is the counterpart of uh, RBI and like a governor. From there, he entered politics. He became Finance Minister. Then he became Finance Minister plus Deputy Prime Minister. And after the last general election, he became, the, he took the current position of Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister. I'm not giving details of this to entice any other central banker to follow the same footsteps. The thought has not occurred to me. So, Dismiss the thought, but I just wanted to say that was not my intention. I would like to, even though I referred to it earlier, I would like to say a couple of minutes to say something about ISAS. We are a think tank within the National University of Singapore, established and funded by the ministries of foreign affairs and trade and industry. There are other think tanks in Singapore, such as the Institute of Southeast Asian, Institute of South, uh, Institute of Middle East, School of Policy Studies, LKY School of Policy Studies, and then we are there at South Asia. The, many people ask, why does Singapore have so many think tanks? The answer is very simple. Singapore is a small country which suffers with, or which has to endure anything that goes on in the world. So it needs to be well equipped with knowledge on the various countries, on the various regions, on the various organizations. So we have this, this particular interest and we have very active institutes that study the various regions. It is something that we do with, in cooperation for the university. We also do it in cooperation with institutes outside. For instance, this, organ, this particular edition of symposium, we are in partnership with, with uh, CII. And we have been partnering CII on many issues. And I want to place my re on record my thanks to them. This afternoon, we have another session, a workshop, where we are partnering Gateway House. And I also want to thank, thank Gateway House. When we discuss this particular program, we were discussing who would be best to be the moderator. The moderator has to be fair, he has to know the issues, and he needs to regulate the question flow and keep within the time. And we asked Mr. Nainan, and I'm very thankful to him for having accepted uh, this invitation. He has been a good friend of uh, ISAS. I've been trying to get him to come to Singapore for various things. Uh, he's, he tries to accommodate that together with a visit to his daughter, which sometimes doesn't work out, but eventually we'll do, get that. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I don't want to take up more of your time. I hope you have a good evening, a good after, good morning rather. And there's a uh, discussion that will go on and then uh, DPM will have a special lunch with uh, some of the guests. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you for being here. I hope you have a fruitful morning. Thank you.
Thank you, Ambassador Pillay. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor now to invite Singapore's Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister for Economic and Social Policies, Mr. Dharman Shanmugaratnam, on stage to deliver the opening remarks. DPM, please. Ambassador Gopinath Pillay, who has successfully corralled all of us to be here this morning. Uh, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Raghuram Rajan, uh, Mr. Nainan and Mr. Karpe and everyone who's here today. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I've been given 15 minutes to speak before I have this uh, pleasure of this uh, dialogue with uh, Raghu. Of course, there's a rich tradition of um, extending the length of your speech so as to minimize interaction and questions from the floor. But uh, given Raghu's presence, I think I'll stick to my time limit. Uh, I think we are at a very interesting time, a uh, very interesting time globally, in Asia, and in each of our own countries. Uh, globally, we are stuck on the second gear, having difficulties moving to fourth gear let alone fifth gear. And that's true uh, almost everywhere in the world, except possibly in China, where they need to move from fifth gear down to a more sustainable pace of growth. But in Asia, uh, something else is happening. Even in the midst of global slowdown, Asia is restructuring. Each of our countries are restructuring. And we're restructuring in the context of a region where there's still demand, there's still a tremendous motive force in middle class consumption and a tremendous motive force with regard to the absorption of skills, technology and knowledge from all over the world and between ourselves as Asians. So both from the demand side, the motive force of middle class consumption and from the supply side, the motive force of transfer and absorption and exchange of knowledge, skills, and technology. Something is happening in Asia that's extremely positive. And that's the context we face ourselves, uh, that we shape policies in today. A sluggish global, global environment, still stuck, not much prospects, I would say, for getting onto fourth gear soon. But prospects in Asia, promise in Asia for growth based on what we ourselves do within our own countries, the reforms we put in place, as well as the, very importantly, the connectivity that we develop with each other. And I think it's good that we're having the Singapore Symposium in India at this time, because India itself is on the cusp of major change. It's already embarked on a process of change, and we can see it rolling out before us, but I think there's a lot more potential, a lot more potential. One of the charming things about being in India is that um, you'll never meet an Indian who doesn't have something negative to say about India. <laughs> so my role today is to try and abstract from the, the usual commentaries, and highlight what I, from some distance, based on my contacts with businesses, based on my contacts with many people, uh, see as some of the uh, important positive changes that are taking place in India, which give me confidence. Uh, first, I would say macroeconomic stability is back, and both on the monetary side as well as the fiscal side, something has been achieved in the last few years that is impressive in the face of challenging, a, a challenging global environment. That's the first point, and I don't need to elaborate on it. Second, something is being achieved with regard to the efficiency of implementation of policies. The Indian, Indian bureaucracy is famous, uh, but it is changing. And I think Prime Minister Modi's initiatives although there's still a long journey ahead, uh, are very important 
in this regard. And it's many different dimensions. I was just asking Raghu about the, I think you call it the Adha bill, and the way it's being implemented. A remarkable feat. One billion people with unique identification with so many benefits, whether in the financial sector or the way social schemes are being administered to prevent leakage, so many benefits. So that's the second factor, improving the way in which things are implemented and injecting efficiency into the bureaucracy. A third factor that gives uh, hope is, I think, the kickstarting of infrastructure. Uh, I know about the latest budget, I think it was 32 billion, uh, going to important projects, rail, road, power, uh, kickstarting infrastructure. Still a lot of work ahead, particularly to catalyze private investment, not just using public monies, but catalyzing private investment. But I think that's a, uh, a third reason for confidence. And a fourth reason, which is, I think, uh, particularly uh, important in the last few years, is devolution. The way in which states are being empowered and the way in which individual states are using that empowerment to compete with each other and to develop a dynamic that is more bottom-up within the politics and within the politics of economic policy making. I think it's very interesting what's happening and there's tremendous potential there as well. So those are the four reasons. Macroeconomic stability, improved efficiency in the bureaucracy and the implementation of policies, the kick-starting of much-needed infrastructural uh, developments, and fourthly, devolution. Uh, it frankly gives me uh, confidence in India, not just based on what's been happening in the last few years, GDP growth being above 7%, but confidence that this is now a new journey and a journey that we in Singapore want to be part of, want to contribute to, and want to benefit from at the same time. The potential can best be summarized by looking at productivity. Um, the level of productivity in India compared to, let's say, the United States, taking that, broadly speaking, as a frontier of sorts, the level of productivity in India was for a long time stuck at about 5 to 6% of the level in the United States, just 1 20th. Even until the 1990s, and even in the early 2000s, it was barely about 6 to 7%. Uh, in the last five years, it has started to pick up quite significantly, and today it's about 12%. But that's still a long way to go, and that illustrates the potential for not just GDP, but the incomes of the average person, incomes across the board, to rise. The fact that productivity can still catch up with global standards across a whole range of sectors, tremendous potential. If you look at India's rate of productivity growth, in the last five years, it was something like um, 3.8%. We may think, oh, not bad, you know, 3.8%, about 4%, let's say. Not bad. But that's actually not good enough and is well below India's potential. If you look, for instance, at the rate of productivity growth that we saw in China or China or about a decade ago when the level of productivity was the same as India today, or look at Korea back in the 1970s when the level of productivity was where India is today. If you look at what happened to those two reasonably large-sized economies, China, of course, continental scale, but Korea, a large-sized economy, uh, they achieved productivity growth of between 5 to 8% at that stage of development. So I would say India has the potential to grow at a rate of productivity growth of not just the impressive 4.4% seen in the last five years, but three to four percent more than that. But it doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen automatically. And I believe that connectivity and skills are a very important way in which we can encourage that potential to be achieved. So that's one way of summarizing it. 
I think our relations between each other, business, broader economic relations, in politics, and the people-to-people -people relations have really grown. India is actually now a, at least from our perspective, a very significant partner of Singapore. Uh, and it's well known that we are a major investor in India. But there are more things that we can do together that make sense from the point of view of India's journey and make sense from the point of view of a Singapore that is still internationalizing, still upgrading, still trying to achieve its full promise. And I'll mention uh, just four areas. First, in finance, there's more we can do together. Infrastructure, which I just spoke about, is a major opportunity. We can still do more to catalyze private finance in infrastructure. It's not a problem unique to India. It's a global issue. There's a lot of money waiting on the sidelines, not looking for extravagant returns, looking for decent returns, upper single digit returns. But there are a lot of obstacles that are preventing the money that's waiting on the sidelines from being invested in infrastructure projects, particularly long gestation infrastructure projects. But we can solve these things. And we are working in Singapore with the World Bank and the private sector, first to develop better project documentation so that there's better certainty on dispute resolution, termination clauses and the like, provide better certainty. Second, we are working on developing infrastructure as an asset class. You know, if you think about how the insurance funds, the sovereign wealth funds, the pension funds manage a very substantial pool of assets, it's an asset allocation process. It's not just looking at projects on a bespoke basis, case by case. You need to decide how much to allocate to this asset class. And it means you need good data on risks, on returns, from a whole range of countries by different verticals, and you need good analysis. And that is not yet in place for infrastructure as an asset class, and that's something we, we're developing as well. Making infrastructure an asset class so as to catalyze the flow of investments from the institutional investors, meaning pension funds, insurers, and sovereign wealth funds. And thirdly, another way in which we can promote infrastructure financing, which we are working on in Singapore, um, is a debt takeout facility that will help the transfer from banks to institutional investors beyond the construction stage or the first stage of infrastructure projects. In other words, beyond the greenfield stage. How do we basically allow banks to recycle their capital and help in institutional investors come in? A debt takeout facility is one of the ideas we have that we're working on. So that's infrastructure, tremendous scope for collaboration between Singapore and India in that space. More broadly, cross-border finance, both banking and non-banking. I think there's particular scope for offshore, rupee-denominated bond issuance. Indian companies are interested, not just the majors, but a range of medium-sized companies are interested. And there's an investor pool in Singapore, quite a diverse investor pool that knows India and wants to invest in India. And the rupee-denominated bonds have uh, features which I think are a win-win. Certainly for the Indian companies, it means the currency risk is taken by the investor. And if the investor is managing it on a, as a portfolio, there are ways in which you can uh, buffer yourself from currency risk. So offshore rupee-denominated bonds, I think, has significant scope in the future. More broadly, cross-border banking, not just Singapore banks lending to major companies in India, but even SMEs. I think there's significant scope left for cross-border banking to be built up between our two countries. Thirdly, less talked about but important, is insurance. Catastrophe risk is an issue on everyone's minds. We know about the natural disasters. And in the case of India, there was a UN study which calculated that India loses about $10 billion per year just through natural disasters. We now know more about the emerging man-made catastrophes, cybercrime, pandemics, terrorism. 
all of us are going to have to grapple with this. But that too is about catastrophe risk that needs to be insured. And this is where, when you think of the scale and complexity of catastrophe risk, it really makes sense to diversify. You've got to be able to aggregate across insurers and across markets. And that's why the reinsurance industry exists. And that's why it has to be global. It can't be country-specific reinsurance. In its, in its very nature, you need diversification to be able to manage that risk. And the Singapore insurance uh, providers, the reinsurance market especially, uh, is well-placed and keen to be able to play a role in catastrophe insurance in India by providing capacity, expertise, and financial relief in case of loss. So that's finance. And I've spoken longer about finance than I will about the next few items. Um, but I want to say as my second major item uh, that we have scope to collaborate on air connectivity. And this is, you know, it's something which many countries grapple with because we all have our own airlines, but we also have the interests of our economy at large to think about. And in the Singapore example, partly because of our size, we decided early on that we'd go for maximizing connectivity and have an open regime rather than a policy of focusing on our own single national airline. This worked well for Singapore in ways that we didn't fully expect even. But air connectivity is critical in so many dimensions. It's critical for foreign direct investment. It's critical for creating a business-friendly environment generally. It's critical for tourism. And I would say in the case of India, it also offers the potential for Delhi and Mumbai to be major hubs for West Asia and a broader landscape. It's not just about people moving in and out of India or businesses moving in and out of India. It is an opportunity for what are now world-class airports in Delhi and Mumbai to be major hubs for West Asia and to not cede that space uh, to your competitors. It's a real opportunity. And when you think of the critical mass of activity, of critical mass of uh, business that flows through India itself, that's a very strong foundation to build a larger international hub out of air connectivity. And here again, Singapore can play a role. Uh, I think this makes eminent sense for India, and it's something which we would like to play a role in. We've got to free up the airspace to benefit our larger economy and to spur the growth of new industries. And finally, actually I just realized I had three areas of collaboration, not four. Um, finally, the whole field of, no, actually I do have four, just remembered. Uh, my third area uh, has to do with education and skills. The most fundamental driver of convergence and productivity, which is what I mentioned earlier, the most fundamental driver of economic development is just human capital. Uh, for all of us, wherever we are in the world. And I think we have the opportunity to deepen our relationships in skills development at a time when India is placing great emphasis on skills development. We already embarked on some projects in Delhi, in Rajasthan, but there's also a lot of just the sharing of ideas on how we go about organizing education and skills training for a future that is quite different from the past. So that's the third area. And finally, smart cities. Singapore is embarked on a journey of becoming a smart nation. We are both a city and a nation. India is embarking on a journey of developing, I believe, 20 smart cities. Tremendous opportunity for investments, for transfer of skills and know-how, and for learning from each other. It's not just going to be one-way learning. Learning from each other. Tremendous opportunity. Our companies are keen. Uh, we have people who are quite excited about what's taking place in India. Of course, Singapore being a small place, we can't get involved in too many cities. But where we do get involved, I think we can add some value on India's smart city journey. So those are the four areas I'd like to mention. Increase connectivity in finance, 
Second, air connectivity. Thirdly, education and skills. And fourthly, collaboration on smart cities. I think there's potential for us to do a lot more together. Singapore is a very small player, but one that's had, uh, intrinsically globalized and intrinsically based on human capital development. And India, which is on a journey of achieving its full promise as a large society that is still very far from what it is able to achieve, but is now moving in a very impressive way. So thank you very much for listening to me, and I look forward to a dialogue with Raghu. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Next is the moment we have been waiting for, the highlight of today's Singapore Symposium. The interactive session with DPM Dharman Shanmugaratnam and Governor Dr. Raghuram Rajan. And with great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together and invite Dr. Rajan and Mr. T. N. Nainan, Chairman of Business Standard <laughs> Limited India, on stage for the session, please. Mr. Nainan will chair the interactive session, and I shall now hand over the session to him. Mr. Nainan, please. Um, thank you very much, and uh, morning, friends. Uh, we have, as was correctly stated, I think, by Ambassador Pillay, uh, two iconic uh, gentlemen um, who are both national leaders and on the global stage um, here with us this morning. And it's a great opportunity to get them to interact with each other on a range of issues. So it's my pleasure to try and um, sort of steer the conversation, if I can, uh, initially uh, onto some international issues, because uh, the subject that we have is partnering for growth and then try and dwell on some bilateral and domestic issues. Um, so I'll start with uh, Mr. Shanmugaratnam. Um, I'd like to quote to you what Dr. Rajan has said uh, in, I forget whether it's a speech or an article he wrote, where he, looking at what's happening in the world and some of the policy issues that you mentioned in your opening remarks on whether there is a need for a new IMF. So I'm, I'm familiar with uh, Raghu's thinking um, and I uh, share his basic way of thinking about the problem and I also agree with him that part of the solution to what is currently a highly uncoordinated international monetary and financial system uh, has to involve the IMF as a custodian of sorts in the system. Uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Rajan on that basic framework of thinking. I think we are some ways off from coming to a clear understanding amongst the major parties, but a process of open thinking has begun, and Dr. Rajan, more than anyone else, has um, been pushing that. Um, I would say there are two dimensions to this, if I could just elaborate for a minute. First is the longer-term vision of what might be a sustainable system, something that is not constantly prone to instability, in exchange rates and capital flows. But we do have a short to medium term problem, well before we can arrive at solutions for the longer term, we do have a short to medium term problem of divergence in performance of economies, particularly the US, which is well on the road to recovery, in fact, it's a relatively healthy economy already, 
versus Europe and Japan, which are still at close to, you know, have minimal growth, and in fact are seeing some weakening in their economies, and versus emerging markets where China is in the midst of a move towards a more sustainable rate of growth, and other emerging markets like India and ASEAN, who are faced with the problems created by the lack of coordination between the major players, problems of volatile capital flows, volatile exchange rates. And China has had to face that more acutely than most players in recent times. What do we do in the short to medium term? And I'll be happy to get uh, Dr. Rajan's views on this. I think we can't keep hoping that the US Fed will postpone normalization of interest rates. First, it doesn't make sense for the US economy. It would be bad monetary policy, in fact. But we have to have some way of preventing that eventuality from also meaning significant instability in exchange rates and capital flows at a time when Japan, Europe, and China are facing very different economic conditions. Some, it's not going to happen by wishing. There has to be some form of coordination. Some form of coordination with regard to exchange rates that involves intervention operations, that involves an understanding as to the zone in which we would like the major exchange rates to be. It would certainly help emerging markets because they've been at the receiving end of exchange rate volatility. But the major players have to agree, not just through one G20 meeting or side meeting. We've got to agree in this, I hesitate to say this, but in the way that the Plaza Accord and the Louvre Accord were agreed on. Imperfect, doesn't guarantee stability, but it is better than leaving it entirely to the short-termism of the markets and the self-reinforcing expectations of the markets. Thank you very much for, for those exhaustive comments. Raghu, do you want to? Uh, uh, no, uh, I think as you would have guessed, uh, Deputy Prime Minister and I uh, agree very much on, uh, on many issues uh, on the international economy. And I, I have to say for this audience, uh, some of whom may not know him, he's one of the uh, central figures in international meetings and he always has something original and interesting to say uh, to the assembly, um, always measured, thoughtful and uh, very valuable insights. Um, I think on this issue, uh, certainly we, what we're facing in the world uh, is really a concatenation of two problems. One, within industrial countries, a concern about longer term growth and where that's coming from. There's, there seem to be headwinds which, we, which are beyond the debt overhang which emerged uh, post-crisis. Uh, perhaps some of these headwinds were in the making even before the crisis, disguised to some extent by the easy borrowing. And two which come to mind immediately are aging of, uh, of populations in, in Germany, um, in, uh, in other parts of Europe, uh, certainly in Japan, uh, but also in China uh, increasingly. So that's one sort of headwind, uh, largely in industrial countries, but also in some emerging markets. And the second headwind that we don't fully understand is the significant slowdown in productivity growth. Where is the productivity that used to be there? Is it disguised or is it absent? Uh, that certainly is, a, is another uh, concern and, and may in fact contribute to lower growth. Given that, there has been a tremendous attempt at stimulating economies back to growth. And the increasing debate is whether the stimulus is creating not just the absence of growth longer term, but in fact retarding growth. There certainly is a little bit of a debate on that. But uh, what uh, the Deputy Prime Minister pointed to, the the fact that that could also create inter-country uh, difficulties because of the flows of capital and uh, currency movements. And, and so uh, the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we moving in the right direction? Is there a better way? 
could we at least try and make sure that we don't impose costs on each other as we try and come out of our uh, own difficulties? So certainly there's a lot of room for discussion. Um, so, uh, on the same uh, international set of issues, um, I find um, that uh, international trade, global trade, um, used to grow always much faster than global GDP growth. And in the years of rapid growth, global trade was actually growing at twice the speed of the global economy. And now, I think for the first time in I don't know how many decades, uh, global trade is actually growing slower than the global economy. Uh, the WTO's numbers suggest uh, increasing protectionism literally across the board um, in the G20 economies. Um, all of these suggest that economies are turning in on themselves. Uh, and you've spoken, I think even recently, about the continuing need to be more open. But the world actually seems to be going in the other direction. Would you like to comment on that? Thank you. Well, that's a very important issue. I think the reasons for the slowdown in global trade uh, are both cyclical and structural. And it's useful to put it in perspective. The cyclical uh, is well known. Commodity prices were on a boom, and they're now correcting. That's a long cycle in commodity prices. It's already happened. Uh, I don't see that continuing to depress global trade, but it's happened. Second, China was on a boom, partly credit financed, and uh, its heavy industries were demanding a lot of commodities from abroad, a lot of materials, and that too was boosting trade. And China is now correcting. It's in a phase of significant cyclical contraction uh, in its heavy industries. But there's also a structural phenomenon, again China-centered, which is that China is now inshoring part of the manufacturing value chain that used to be performed in other countries. There's been a restructuring of the Asian supply chain. More of it is now being done in China, and more of the high-value activities are being done in China. But even that is not something that I see as a continuing trend. It's happened over the last decade. China has restructured, but there's still a lot of scope, a lot of scope in global value chains. And I, I would just add, and you know, I know Raghu has very thoughtful views on this, although the old-style export-oriented industrialization strategies uh, may no longer be viable, particularly if, not done by, if done by every country, it may not be viable in a world of weak global demand. There's still tremendous growth potential yet in supply-side linkages between our economies. Put simply, and India is in fact the classic case, or the most extreme case, I would say, because India has something like a quarter of the world's population, and in the next 10 years, you're going to have about one-third of the world's labor force, but you only have 2% of global trade accounted for by India. So we don't have to replicate what China did or Korea did in an earlier era, but there's tremendous scope, in my opinion, for India to be part of the supply-side linkages that global value chains bring. And those supply-side linkages, which have been very important in East Asia, are really linkages that are about knowledge, skills, and technology. Singapore benefited tremendously from global value chains. We would not have arrived at where we are today if not for it. But even if you look at larger economies, there's still significant scope for FDI interpenetration, significant scope for sourcing parts of our value chain from other countries. And the studies show now, I can't remember which study it was, but it was a very good study, that shows that the more you go to the higher value end of manufacturing and industry generally, the more sophisticated the product, the higher the value, the more there is multi-country sourcing. It's in the nature of the business. Specialization matters, depth of expertise matters, and it comes from very different locations. So I think there's still significant scope left in global trade, and it'll be a mistake to start 
battening the hatches, to start erecting barriers quietly and surreptitiously. Um, Raghu, I mean, please do come in on any of those issues, but I want to put a specific question to you, which is um, on the supply chain, that our success in services exports, including tech, was because these companies fed into global networks and succeeded, which we've not been able to do in manufacturing. Uh, do you see the prospect of that changing, or is it on the cards, or we still need to cover a long distance before we get there? No, I, I, I think we're, uh, we're ripe for change. Uh, I think the emphasis of the government on infrastructure creation, uh, improving logistics networks, some of which are improving because of private sector um, companies like Flipkart, Snapdeal, and so on, uh, creating a huge uh, change in, uh, in warehousing and in uh, logistics. Um, in power, for the first time, we are close to power self-sufficient. Of course, I know the commentary on, on the fact that some no, no, demand I, is not I, being expressed. I completely agree with you. We are, uh, we are actually for the first time. For the first time, close to. Of course, if the um, distribution company restructuring is fully done, perhaps full demand can be expressed. But we're close, and uh, given that uh, uh, today we're using only about 60 to 65 percent of available capacity, there's still room for, for yes. uh, more power production. So power infrastructure, we have some way to go on human capital, but my sense is we have almost everything for the uh, leap in production. Whether it's manufacturing, whether it's services, we can take a step uh, forward. I think global linkages is the way the world is going. We, we have to take advantage of that. We should not keep saying not invented here and reject ideas that come from elsewhere. And I don't think our younger generation is in, in that mood. It's, it's willing to take the best from the world and run with it. So I suspect we are on the verge of a revolution here. Uh, I do believe that we should allow our enterprises to find their way, that uh, not plan too much the path that one has to go through, uh, but instead create the, the, um, uh, the kind of infrastructure, the kind of uh, business environment which will allow them uh, to go where they desire to go. And I think they will find the kinds of networks that uh, uh, the Dep Deputy Prime Minister has been talking about, that will happen and uh, we will be in a better place five to 10 years from now. Um, regional issues and inevitably China. You mentioned um, what um, you've mentioned before about China ensuring and lengthening its own domestic supply chain and value addition. Um, and China is also going through uh, some other turbulence, uh, there's been significant capital flight. Uh, there are reports in the press about uh, people leaving in large numbers. Uh, what is the impact of this on the rest of East Asia, particularly Southeast Asia? Is, is a lot of the money coming to you? Do you see um, turbulence uh, as a result of these big changes uh, to economies? who are supplying basically to the Chinese market and now find that this is changing? Well, I think uh, China was uh, hit by two things uh, at once. Uh, first, what we spoke about earlier, which was that the beginning of the path of Fed normalization of interest rates um, uh, was leading to a strengthening of the Chinese currency. And this happened at the same time that uh, uh, China uh, was uh, gradually liberalizing on its exchange rates. And what we saw was a significant number of corporates in China who had incurred US dollar debt, then wanting to hedge themselves, which led to a significant capital outflow. Now that's a finite problem. Uh, and from my understanding, a good part of that hedging has already taken place. Yes. Second, you now have considerable stability in the Chinese exchange rate. But it illustrates the broader problem we were talking about earlier, that we have a system where, as 
Dr. Rajan has been uh, saying, countries set their monetary policies based on domestic mandates uh, without too much regard for the spillovers and the consequences in the international system. And it, for emerging countries especially, uh, these are things which you can't control for very much. It's not as if you set, you can control for it through your own domestic monetary policy settings. It's just not the way things work. There is a global cycle, there's a risk on, risk off cycle, uh, and you get buffeted by it. Uh, so China is now in a much more stable place after going through a rest, uh, rough patch. I think it's managed the problems very well, in my opinion, and I don't see a continued uh, significant capital outflow occurring. Okay, so that's a significant thing, which you say that some of the fears that were sort of fairly widespread in the first two months of this year, you're saying is actually uh, that phase is over. Uh, Dr. Rajan, would you? Well, um, um, I, 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 I certainly would broadly agree. And um, I mean, one has to ask uh, about the nature of global capital flows when, uh, you know, you start worrying excessively about uh, serious depreciation in a country which is running a large current account surplus as well as has three trillion dollars of reserves still. So uh, I guess uh, the, the, the thinking must have been that the Chinese wanted to depreciate their currency significantly and therefore let's get out before uh, they actually do it. At least that was the, the source of the panic. Uh, but I think the Chinese authorities in every forum since then have been talking about how they wanted to maintain a stable renminbi uh, and have matched their actions, with, uh, their, their words with actions. Uh, I think that has been a source of stability in the last few weeks in the, in the, in the global economy. Uh, and uh, I think going forward, uh, the hope uh, that uh, uh, Tharman talked about that we would get a stable landing uh, is is very much uh, something we're all hoping for. Um, I, I think uh, one of the mistakes we make sometimes in India is uh, seeing uh, a downturn elsewhere as uh, necessarily beneficial for us. I think uh, it's important to say that we would never benefit from another large country doing badly. There may be silver linings in the sense that Commodity prices may be cheaper, et cetera, et cetera. We may compete less. We may have less competition in certain areas. But the world, again and again, we're discovering is so interconnected that any problem elsewhere in the world comes back to affect us very quickly. We are not immune. OK. Um, regional moving towards West Asia. I was intrigued by your comment about becoming an aviation hub. Uh, the sense we have uh, here in India is that we've more or less exported our aviation market to the West Asians. Um, and your comments um, were suggesting that there is another way of doing it. So would you like to elaborate? You're looking at me or? <laughs> okay. Well, no, I, I don't have uh, much detail to add on this. Um, but I think you know, 10 years ago, you couldn't make this claim because there was a problem with Indian airports. Uh, that is no longer the case. And you have in Delhi and Mumbai uh, an infrastructure that allows you to play a major regional and global role. It's a tremendous source of business. It creates many jobs. Uh, I mean, Singapore may be an extreme example because we're small, but the number of quality jobs created because of the airport and logistics is very large. It's a significant chunk of our, of our total workforce, quality jobs at every, dime, every part of that chain. So I think it's a real opportunity for India in terms of job creation, for business value creation, but it means uh, a paradigm shift, recognizing that connectivity benefits the broader economy and ultimately benefits everyone, including individual airlines. Um, Dr. Rajan, I want to pose this as a broader question to you, which is that there is a view on economic policy which says you need to be strategic 
in the way you approach policy from a national perspective versus an approach which says you just need to be more open and the benefits will flow. Um, now, many countries play this differently. We've tried to play it in one way on solar energy. We've tried different things at different stages in aviation. Uh, where do you broadly come in on this? Are you on the sort of strategic policy side or are you on the open market side? Um, uh, I think it, uh, I'm give, going to give you the <laughs> economist's answer. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are certain areas where you uh, do have to nurture uh, structures and and saying the market would develop those structures uh, may be a little too over optimistic so uh, I, I guess that is where you where you what you mean by strategic you're you're sort of creating domestic structures that can that can survive uh, in in a broader world uh, but also those structures can't be nurtured forever they have to link up, they have to compete uh, after, a, you know, uh, the appropriate nurturing. Of course. Um, and then there are other places where you have fully established uh, entities and uh, if you let them have their way, you will never have competition. You will, nev you will have uh, essentially uh, all the problems of monopoly and that, that's where, uh, you know, let them compete, bring bring everybody uh, in and, and see what happens. So I, I think it really depends from, 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 from place to place. Um, I think for the most part, uh, in many industries, we have pretty strong players. A and so uh, we certainly, for us, the brunt is of opening up and liberalizing uh, rather than protecting. But there may be certain areas where, where that That's is true. Focusing briefly on domestic issues uh, before I throw this open uh, to the floor for questions and we wind up in, in about 20 minutes. Um, Dr. Shanmugaratnam, you are now also the Minister for Coordinating Economic and Social Policies. Uh, could you explain what that means? Uh, what I have heard, I'm not sure if it's correct, what I have heard is that you are looking at where Singapore can or should be 20 years down the road, and then how to prepare to get there. Is that a correct reading? Well, I think that there are two ways of thinking about it. One, as you say, is um, it's got to be deeply ingrained in policy making that uh, the long term is what we have to be centrally focused on. And what we do in the short term has to be a way of getting to the long term. Uh, that has to be deeply ingrained in our thinking. Uh, we've, we're trying to do that as well as possible in Singapore. Uh, in a world where it's very hard to predict what will happen in the long term, but all the more that we need to develop the capabilities and the institutions that can respond to changes as they occur and still give us a decent chance of getting to higher productivity, higher incomes and greater resilience especially because we don't know what's going to happen. But it means you've got to invest now in institutions of collaboration between public and private sector, capabilities and skills that are deeper than we used to have, and a certain resilience and adaptability. So that's very important, and it's not just about an education ministry or a trade and industry ministry. It's about some degree of concert within government and a way of collaborating with the private sector that is not, as Dr. Rajan was saying, uh, was, was cautioning about, that is not a sort of a top-down industrial policy, but is market-driven and market-friendly. So that's one, uh, something which...